I started when I was 10. Um, and that was Glasgow Garden Festival on, on the left there. Um, and then went on from there. Along the way, I've, I think I counted about 12 different national trophies of one, um, some of which multiple times. Um, I like showing, that's what we do. That's what brings me to Dahlia's is, is the showing, the competition, the level, the camaraderie, uh, the banter. And why Dahlia's? Probably because um, it's something that if you in, you get it out. So Dahlia will respond to the amount of effort you put into it. Um, and I think sometimes that's, that's quite rewarding when it comes to putting a lot of effort in. <clears throat> So this is what we're really talking about, um, garden dahlias, or dahlias in the garden. I, I, I sort of find a problem with the word garden dahlias because I don't think you should ever separate the two. Um, but in an ideal world, you know, if you're growing garden, dahlias in the garden and you want to fill the bed up with colour, that's not a bad way of going about it. Um, you'll see that whoever's done this, because it's not my picture, has used the right varieties in the right place according to the heights that they're growing. And, and that's that's sometimes a challenge because I know I've been given plants and someone will tell me it grows three foot tall and I put it in my garden and it's suddenly five foot tall. Um, vice versa. So some of that will only come from experience. Just to prove I do grow some dahlias in the garden. Um, that's my garden or part of my garden. Um, it hasn't got a dahlia plot in it. That's on the allotments. And now and again, I, I cut them and, and put them in vases um, with what else is in the garden. But generally, they're, they're the tubers from my propagating, so it's quite handy. Because if I need another tuber, I can always nip it out into the garden and dig one up. Um, but I don't tell the, the other half that's the reason. <laughs> and then that's what would uh, be an exhibition garden or a plot, a daily plot. Now, just because those plants there have been controlled you know, restricted in numbers and everything that we would do as an exhibition grower to them, it doesn't actually restrict the impact um, that you get from them. It's just perhaps the length of time that they'll be flowering for is, is what you're sacrificing. But, you know, growing for show doesn't always mean not growing for colour or a wow factor. So, what variety? You tell me is, uh, I think, the answer. I mean, everyone's got their favourites. There's thousands and thousands of varieties. Um, what is a garden variety? Well, it, it's more with <laughs> free flowering, proof or weather proof. There's no point growing stuff that the weather will damage. Strong habit, good length of stem for cutting, makes a good tuber so you can store it and keep it better. Um, and primarily, it's a garden variety because you want it in your garden is one that appeals to you, you want to look at it, and you're going to look at it for probably three or four months, hopefully in flower, um, and it's going to make you want to put the effort in to, to, to grow it. Show variety really is all the above, ideally. I think we'd all wish all the show varieties ticked all those boxes, um, but it conforms to show standards of, of what we're growing, the classification. Um, the only difference with us showmen is we'll suffer some of the problems um, if we can work around it um, for the flower. Um, things like poor tuber makers, um, not weatherproof, they're the things that we'll we're tolerate um, because we can put covers up, um, we can propagate early and we can get around it with facilities. Seed raised is simple. You can buy a packet of seeds, sow them, germinate them, grow them. It's worth remembering that anything from seed, however clever they might say on the packet that they are pom-pom dahlias or they're cactus dahlias or anything else, and they show you these lovely pictures of double bloom cactus on the packet, they're seed raised. You can guide the majority of what the form might be from where it's come from, but don't expect to see what you see on the packet. It will give you what, what it wants to. The benefit is you might find something in there that you particularly like that isn't already on the market. And as long as you maintain that tuber and that plant, that's your variety. You can keep it, you can call it what you like, and you can do what you like with it. Um, knowing that it's probably or possibly the only one of that type out there. But 
it is a lottery. So if you want to grow what you see on the packet, you've got to grow from, from green plants or the tuber packs themselves. Brief classifications, it's worth noting them, it's worth knowing about them, um, even for the garden, because certain forms will perform better um, in the garden and particularly certain sizes. So, um, you know, if you want weatherproof flowers, it's probably not a good idea to go down the giant and large route. Um, some of the mediums are, are more weather tolerant than others, but really smalls, miniatures, ponds, water lilies, colorettes, and all of those are all good classifications really for, for the garden. They're free flowering, colorful, the bees will enjoy it on some of them. But once you know what you like, if you can pin it into a classification group when you're, you're thumbing through catalogues looking for more of that type, at least you know, you know what you're looking for. And I will point out, and I said it last week, dinner plate isn't one of those classifications. Um, although they still, and I've got one here, um, like to pack it. Okay, I'll go and sit with you on that. So they all would sit under giant and large decorative, generally what they call dinner plate. Here we go, there's a the sweet shop, or part of the sweet shop. Um, I've got some of those packets on my table here, and the only one that I surprised myself with this year is this one, which you can see further down, which is called Mexican Star. So finally, some of the scented uh, dahlias are making it into the, the hanging packs. Um, I wouldn't have said they're gonna knock your nose off the smell, but if you, if you cut them, put them indoors, um, in that environment, they tend to, to or it intensifies the scent. Varieties like uh, Honker and things like that will also give off a scent, but that's actually, um, say my garden centre, the garden centre I work at, um, director of, and that's part of the, the range of dahlias that we've got now. Um, and we try and have a decent range. The video there is actually uh, my DVD on loop, so I can really put the customers to sleep um, watching that. But it's a massive variety out there. I think people perhaps put too much um, emphasis on certain varieties. Oh, I must have a cafe au lait or I must have a, well, must you, you know, all of them come with faults and probably cafe au lait is one of the worst ones for, for having faults. It's, it's clock face, weak stemmed, not the strongest of growers, but it's a different color flower and it's got its uniqueness. So as long as you're prepared to put up with the, the pitfalls of some of these varieties, yeah, lovely, but I mean, that's just a snippet of them. When I said about knowing the size, I made it easy in the garden centre. I put all the short ones together, which these are all the lily puts and the low growers, um, that are perfect for growing in pots, growing in front of border. Um, and I, I've done quite a bit of growing in lily puts over the years for the, the society displays and things like that. And they are fantastic plants. Um, if you grow geraniums in your beds or anything like that, actually lily puts will fill that gap and probably a lot easier and a lot less prone to, to the wet weather and things like that that geraniums are. Um, so don't, don't discount them from a, a bedding point of view, a mass colour point of view. And obviously if you've got tubers, you can take cuttings um, like you can with geraniums and, and multiply your volumes up very easily. But it's key to know, and when you, you look on the, the packets, they, they give a size, but I wouldn't trust some of them. Um, so, you know, ask on the site, see what the average height for some of these are for, for, for different people, and you might might get somewhere near it. Some of the select ones like tartan, um, creme de cassis, you know, they seem to be achieving a higher price than everything else. I think it's just because people seem to want them more, not because they're, they're rarer or of less availability, um, but they're all there. And, it's easy. Um, where to buy them? You hear lots of scary uh, stories, I think. Um, garden centres, same, the person that's got a share in one is a good place to go. Um, but generally you'll find garden centres will deal, hopefully, um, with, with good companies, good trades. Um, we always use tailors um, and we find them pretty good. You'll always get the odd tuber in the packet that shouldn't be there. Um, and they are all supplied from Holland. And I don't care really if you're Sarah Raven or anyone else. Sarah Raven is not 
filling their garden up with dahlia tubers, growing them herself and deciding whether they're any good or not. She's just buying them from Holland and put them in, in a packet with her name on. Um, there are various grades of dahlia. You know, when you buy them, we buy them um, loose sometimes through work and you can get grades one to five. One being good, five being terrible. So when you often buy your, you buy your cheaper packet, your 99p tuber, I know if I buy a box of 80, I can probably get them for about 80 pence a tuber. But if someone's selling them a pound, then they're not paying 80 pence and they're probably not buying grade one tubers. Um, so you do get in some ways what you pay for. So that's your DIY, your Wilco's and big box. They'd be fine if you get what you ordered and it starts, nothing wrong with it. But you know, you're taking some risk in the element. Online, it's the same as all the others. Unless you're buying from a specialist, um, you're you're going to get what, what's been sent from Holland um, and you take your chances with that. No difference is you'll probably pay postage when you can walk in a garden centre and pick your own and select, you know, most of these tubers, you can see what the tuber looks like in the back of the pack and you can pick one that looks like it's going to do the job for you online. Someone else is doing that for you. Specialist nurseries, that would be Jack Gott, Halls of Heaven. These are what I would call specialist nurseries, not, you know, on sellers as such. Um, and they are producing their own stock and you're getting what they know is um, being sent. And you'll put more chance of picking up some of the, the show varieties from those, those suppliers. You might pay a, a slight premium for it, but in my opinion, probably worth it. Um, specialist societies, that's the Essex, Kent, Dahlia, and you know, there's lots of societies. Um, they all generally hold plant sales or tuber sales, maybe not in the current situation. Um, but if you want show varieties and you want them uh, as a good stock at a reasonable price, then you probably wouldn't go wrong there at all. Or from a grower, there's enough of us out there um, that grow show and for garden. And quite honestly, I've never met a, a miserable daily grower yet. Um, and then if you, well, apart from one, maybe. Um, <laughs> but, um, if, you, if you communicate with them, you show interest, um, most people will give you something if they've got it spare. Um, and I wouldn't be afraid to go down that route. Same as share from a friend. You know, we've all got them, move them around, swap them around, um, and just keep, keep going. You'll, you'll find something different every time. Propagation. This is probably the bulk of, uh, of the talk because much beyond this, then, then it's in your hands um, as to what you do and where you take it. There's many ways of propagating. You can take cuttings, you can split the tuber, um, you can split them into chicken eggs, which is a step further along the way. Plant and hope, that's, that seems to be quite a common one. Um, you buy your packets, you, you put them in the ground and you hope they start and stick their heads up. Um, Leave them alone, so that's when you've generally grown them once, they're in the garden. Um, and more often than not, um, I'm sure most of us have found it. I'm quite lazy when it comes to my daily plot. I'll dig out what I want. Um, and then quite often the rest will get dug in or, or rotivated in um, as I'm digging. And generally the biggest weed on my plot is dahlias. Um, and they've been left in the ground and then you start getting all these shoots appearing in between the plants that you've planted out where little pieces have overwintered. So, you know, perhaps we worry too much about, about it and sometimes the best way of, way of caring for them is to not care. Um, so that's leave them alone and from seed. Well, sow your seed and away you go. Don't sow seeds too early if you want them in the garden. Um, probably March time is, is fine for seeds. They will grow, they will flower, and they should produce um, a decent tuber at the end of that year. I think there's a a bit of a, a fallacy that, that plants from seeds won't produce tubers in the same year. They will, um, and they probably produce quite a decent one. So there's different ways, and we'll try and cover over um, as many of those as we can. So there's the different tubers. Um, chicken legs is generally a uh, across the water thing. We don't tend to deal with chicken legs in the UK. Um, you, you'll get a field tuber if someone's giving it to you, or a pot tuber or equivalent if you're buying these from the halls or even in the, the, the Dutch packets. I tend to think they're very close to a pot tuber where they've been growing in light soils um, and close together with little feed. 
Bill tubers are the, produced from the cutting of that year, and you can see the sort of size tubers they, they can produce. Whatever your route is on that, um, it's pretty much the same methods, it's just how much space you've got. Probably if you're very first starting out into, into growing and you want to try it, if you're not going to grow a lot of plants, then probably the packet tubers are fine, or even just buy some cuttings of varieties that, that appeal from the specialist nurseries. They will arrive on your doorstep at the time that is appropriate to your facilities you've got. And you just pot them up, keep them going for a couple of weeks and plant them. Learn the plant before you, you worry about this side of it. Um, as far as getting tubers awake, if you're going to take cuttings from them and you want to multiply your plants um, to the greater extent, then probably end of February um, into March would be fine um, and you'll still be able to take cuttings from them. If you're likely to just get it going and plant the tuber, then go into March a bit more. The thing to remember with a garden is and with dahlias in general, is that the sooner they're awake, the more advanced the plant that you plant, the earlier it will flower. Um, and if you want colour in the garden, I've had tubers that I've planted out from the greenhouse in flower at the end of May. Um, and they don't stop, they don't go, I've, I've flowered for two months now, I'll better stop. They will keep on going until the frost comes. So if you've got facility to, to wake them up, keep them frost free and growing, do so, um, and you'll get the benefits by earlier flowering. If you haven't, then just don't rush, don't panic about all us idiots showing, showing you taking cuttings um, in the greenhouse now, but we're doing it for different reasons. Um, you don't need a greenhouse to start them off. If you just pop one of the packet tubers into a, a five inch pot, pop it on the windowsill, you'll find it will soon start to wake up under normal temperatures. It's keen to know, it's good to know what a tuber is and what you're looking for, the stem, quite often in, in the packet tubers that these stems are quite small and you, you'd be turning the thing upside down and around trying to work out what weighs up. Um, but you can normally find the stem and where most of the small tubers are, are, are coming from and the eyes are the bits where they join that stem and they're the parts that are gonna start shooting for you. Um, familiarize yourself with it before you put it in the pot. Unfortunately, green side up doesn't work with uh, tubers. You have to actually work, work out which is top. Um, I'm sure if you put them on this side, they still do something, but um, get used to them. Apologies for the scale there. I'm not expecting any of you to um, do this on your windowsill. It'll be quite a big windowsill. Um, but I haven't got very many pictures of, of doing it any other way. So tubers, these are field tubers you're just nestling them into compost. Again, so you can use trays, pots, whatever you've got. Um, try and keep the crown of the tuber, that was the bit, I know my cursor's not very big, but this part around here, free of the uh, soil, um, because that's the part that will rot. It's all the stem that, that fails, um, and then it works its way through. Um, just nestle them in. I, I tend to think anything around about 18 degrees uh, C is fine if you've got a bit more than fine, but not too hot. Don't think if you cook them, they're going to fly away quicker. It doesn't happen. Um, they tend to rot rather than grow. Um, I water them in or use damp compost when, you, when they're set up. Um, and then just purely allow them to grow before you start putting too much water on. Yes, if they really dry out and they've been, you know, a pain to, to get going, add a bit of water, but Keep them on the dry side until you see some signs of life growing from them. Then these are just what would be pot tubers in seed trays. So, you know, we've got a normal scale here and they're flown away and thrown loads of uh, shoots. And at this point, and it depends if you've started them later, um, you could be looking to divide these tubers. If this is earlier and you want to take cuttings, then perfect, take cuttings. Um, it's all about timing. And I think with dahlias, even with showing, you've got to be able to count backwards um, because everything is backwards. You, you start at a show date or start at when you want the flowers to flower in your garden. And there are sort of set times that things take and there's no good starting something, you know, late and then expecting it to be there early. You've got to plan 
to what you want to achieve. So the beer away, your cuttings are there. Remember, once you start taking cuttings, the tubers will continue to give you more. You're going to don't cut into the tuber and take the, the eye away. Just leave a pair of leaves at the base there. And each one will give you at least another two shoots after you've taken them. Um, you'll hear every size, type, high, small, tips, long, little ones. I know Ian likes little ones. Um, I don't think it really matters. Um, as a guy, as a rule, the size of type of cutting is less important than the environment that you've actually got to root them in or how you're trying to root them. Um, if, if your facilities suit small tip cuttings, then great, but not everyone's will. And I, I find this a, a battle every year um, because it, there is no set answer to this. Um, there's just quite a few variables and it's just learning the variables. So the first batch of cuttings I took this year, probably about three weeks ago, uh, about I took 30 cuttings and I think I managed to lose about 26 of them um, because I thought I'll just do it the way I normally do it. But the day limps are shorter, the day bright light is less, um, the humidity was too high. And it, unfortunately, it's, it's a certain amount of trial and error in this just to, to work it out. So I moved the, the propagator, it's only a, a sealed propagator, more into the light of the greenhouse. Um, I re in, reduced the temperature, it reduced the amount of humidity, i.e. opened the vents. And I took another 20 cuttings 10 days ago and they're all still alive, which is uh, generally if they get past that stage, then they're going to root. They might take three weeks to root instead of two weeks, but it doesn't really matter how long they take as long as they get roots. Um, and you can see from that array, there's some thin ones, some fatter ones, longer ones. I probably would um, tend to go another a joint up on most of those cuttings uh, and, and go there rather than down there. But it doesn't, so it doesn't matter. It unfortunately is trial and error. Use a good open compost um, you probably want at least 50 percent of your compost to be non-compost i.e perlite grit sand or grit um, something that will open the compost up and agitate it i found adding some more sand into the mix seemed to help as well um, and as you go on in the season and and the daylight light is better and it's warmer you find it that even matters less. You can probably just poke them straight into multi-purpose and they will root. Um, as far as compounds to root them in, does it matter? Do you need it? Probably helps you get a better, perhaps stronger root system if you use it, but uh, I would say, no, you don't need it. Um, it's the environment. It all comes back to just getting the, the balance between temperature, light and humidity and compost correct. And unfortunately, um, so, you know, trial and error is, is a way to go on that. Um, but if you start around again, 18 to 20 degrees, if you can maintain that. But, but um, if you look on the YouTube video channel, the NDS YouTube channel, Ian shows you how to take cuttings and he roots them in a pot with a plastic bag on the reds um, on the windowsill. Um, so there's so many ways, but just 18 to 20, not too humid. Um, an amount of airflow, plenty of air in the compost, keeping damp, um, but not sitting in water, is not a bad place to start. And you will learn with, with what environment you've got. Um, someone said, how often would you water? I think in the blue trays, um, probably about once a week, once a fortnight, and then once or twice a week, once they're, they're growing. <laughs> there we go, cutting into a pot. Um, you can see it's quite a gritty mix. They tend to root better for some reason. It's probably the air if they're around the edge of the pot rather than in the middle of the pot, but they still root if they're in the middle. Um, they just root a bit slower. Um, that with a bag on its head and a couple of sticks to stop the bag can, from contacting the, the leaves will work. And you can do that, as I say, on the windowsill, in the greenhouse. It, it doesn't matter. We're trying to produce a plant and the only thing to really remember is knowing what you're growing and if you're growing a pom particularly um poms you can have as many flowers on there without really being detrimental to, to the stem and the flower size 
So you're trying to get those growing as a bigger plant um, and perhaps remove the growing tip in the pot. Um, the rest, just get a plant in the pot so you can get it in the ground. That's really all that's important. We're, only lo we're looking for this to, to show. We're not timing them for, for flower timing. We're not trying to restrict them too much. We're just trying to get a plant that we can handle, keep it frost free and plant it. That I would say is sensible if you're trying to grow a lot of plants, you know, five or 10 plants of each variety and you've only got one or two tubers. Splitting the tuber is probably the easiest way if you're just trying to increase your stock by one or two times of what you started. Most tubers um, will, will divide into two or three sections. Um, I don't like to do it when they're dormant. Um, I find that if you just nestle them into the compost um, and wait until you've got some eyes showing, um, then you know where you're cutting. You, you, you're taking the risk out of it and the plant's already growing. So it tends to grow on better when you then pop these into individual pots. So just nestle it on there, allow for these green shoots to start showing themselves. There's one there and one there. And literally you're just cutting through the stem. You're just gonna go through the middle of the stem as long as you've got the clump of tubers and the eye, that's a plant that will do. Um, pot it into probably a five inch pot um, to give it a bit of room and just keep it ticking over. Um, yes, I do use um, some horticultural grit in the mix as a question out there. And I particularly more use it when um, putting the tubers into the trays, just to add, add drainage um, into it and add a bit for potting on more so than, than cuttings. Um, so splitting the tuber is your easy method with little uh, uh, facilities um, and you can double your, your stock. Um, so you buy it for $1.99 and you can chop it in half if you've got two plants. But I would suggest getting them awake before you do it is, is probably the safest um, way. Or you can just plant it and leave it. It works. Um, it, they're a herbaceous perennial by nature. You can just plant them. Um, I wouldn't plant them in the ground much before sort of mid-March. If you've got a soil thermometer, it's quite useful. Um, most of the veg growers and most growers would say that once the soil temperature is around about 10 degrees, um, plants will grow. Um, much before that, they're going to sit there. And the longer a dormant tuber sits there um, doing nothing and the ground is wet, it, it could rot before it grows. Um, so just keep an eye on the weather, keep an eye on the on your soil temperature, um, and that will vary where you are in the country. And again, I would advise if you can put these tubers in trays or pots and just wake them up before you plant them, um, then you will get flowers earlier. That's, that's all we're trying to get is, is flowers as early as possible, so we can plant as many as possible and going forward. You'll see that th this um, picture shows a single stake in, in the ground and there's various ways of, of supporting your dahlias. They do need it um, if they're going to be probably above about three foot. Obviously the dwarf bedders and lily puts, they don't. And there's, there's probably more ways than I could tell you of, of people doing it with different methods, but a single stake is fine and people seem to prefer this for garden dahlias because they've not got a sea of sticks sticking up. I prefer free canes and string as it grows. And I think if you know the height of the plant, so if you've got a plant that's going to flower at five foot and you use four foot canes, by the time you push them in the ground a bit and the plant is flowering, you won't see the canes, you won't see what's supporting it and it will hold the plant. You don't need to hold it right up to the top. You're only holding um, probably half to two thirds of the plant will, will do the job and keep them upright. Um, and I used canes on the picture of my garden you saw there, but you wouldn't see the canes or, or the string. Um, if you're going to leave it and leave it in the ground over, over winter, then you probably want to make sure that the drainage is good in the ground that you're, you're planting. Um, if you're like me in Essex on, on pure clay, really, um, plant them higher. Just raise the area that you're planting slightly so you're, you're lifting the tuber above uh, groundwater or the water table. Um, add plenty of grit and organic matter and perhaps mulch over the top a few inches to, to stop some of the cold getting into there. Um, but that's the hardest bit really, getting them growing. Once you've got a plant, they're, they're growing themselves. Um, that's, that's the beauty of them. The, the store, the tuber is the store, 
it's all in there and all they want to do is grow and flower. Um, a, B, C, D, it was sort of unintentional. And when I was typing it, I realized that it was almost an alphabet, so I changed some words. Um, so a good open site. Dahlias don't like um, being growing under trees. They don't particularly like too much enclosed. They like a bit of sun. They come from Mexico. Mexico is pretty sunny from what I hear. Um, so they like plenty of light. They will tolerate a, an amount of shade at parts of the day, but the more open the site, the better. But bear in mind, they could be more susceptible then to wind and, and else. Base dressing. If you're going to grow dahlias, there's probably one need to feed, and that is in the ground when you're planting or before you're planting. Good ground preparation, forking it over, adding some organic matter um, into the ground. So things like just compost multi-purpose or, or manure compost, just to open the ground up, it, it will pay dividends. And the use of uh, bone meal, grow more, blood fish and bone, chicken pellets, whatever it is you prefer, some people prefer a, a, the organic or non-organic, it doesn't really matter. Any food in that ground that is going to slowly release over the season is better than none. Um, and, and that's really all they will need. You can add more, and as I said earlier, the more you put into them, the time and effort, the more you will get out. But Good handful of bone meal, a couple of weeks before you plant in that area, will do doing well. Care, well, that is supporting the plants, that is watering them, don't let them dry out too much. Feeding, if you want to give them a liquid feed every now and again, do so. They won't, they won't argue, they won't sort of uh, <laughs> say no thanks, but um, there isn't a great need um, as long as the base dressing is there. Water is the most important thing at dry times. Um, also caring is, is keeping an eye on the bugs and the critters and the things that are going to damage the plant in, in its going and we we'll sort of get onto those bits earlier. If I could say one or two things, because the first one is get them growing before you plant them. This bud and dead head is the one thing that people are always frightened of doing. They don't like doing it. Um, but it's the biggest benefit to the plants and the longevity of the plant flowering. And I will cover that as we go through it a bit in a moment. For me, importantly, enjoy it. Just, just enjoy what you do, enjoy what you grow and enjoy what you like looking at. Um, how often liquid feed will be once a month, once a fortnight, once a week, whatever you really want. Um, any is better than none and what sort of Really, if you're only stuck to um, a tomato food, a higher potash food, you probably, with your base dressing, wouldn't need to liquid feed them until we get towards into July, really, anyway, because your, your original fertiliser is still working. And then just a, a higher potash feed, like tomato food, will be fine from there. If this was me, my showing talk, we'd be talking a lot more about feeding and how often and how much. and. Uh, I can be accused of probably too much. Um, look out for pests. Um, that can come in the form of other growers visiting your plot, um, but generally it's it's the likely suspects. This would be my plot. You're not, I've put it there because you can see I plant in a well. You, the ground around there is raised. I use a spade to plant the plants, not a trowel, um, and I, I dig a bigger hole and allow a well around the plant. Um, over time, as you hoe the beds, you'll knock that soil in and around the, the plant, um, and that will almost help earth them up. It, will, it won't do any harm. But when you're watering or it rains, the water will be focused towards that root ball of the plant, not running off down the garden and, and watering your busy lizards instead of your dahlias. Um, the first cane is there for support, and you can see on the right-hand side, the other two are in there um, at angles, ready for the stream to come. One is, a, is fine, you probably don't need to support your plants, probably until they're a good couple of foot high. Um, but it's one of those jobs I, I tend to do earlier than later. But the well is quite important. That can save a lot of time and will concentrate what you're doing to the plant rather than other plants on the round. Spacing there is about two foot apart, and you can probably use that in your beds and borders as the same. Two foot between your plants, the plants will grow, touch each other, probably you won't see the gaps, but it's given them enough room to grow and get light in the early stages. 
Slugs and Snails, early doors. Um, yeah, that's, they're the, they're the, the uh, favourites. Um, you know, you, you plant your dahlias and you might as well ring, ring the dinner bell. Um, they'll turn up. And they will like some varieties more than others. And, and it, it's a bizarre one. Whatever your method is, and I, I shall try and be careful not to go down um, any recommendation of chemical route. Um, that's not my qualification. I sell the stuff in the garden centre, but I'm not qualified to tell you what to use. Um, but things like slug pellets do work, but I do know that they are also the most over-applied chemical in the garden. And you'll find now that you can only ever buy them in smaller tubs because they were overused. So 450 grams, I think, is the maximum size you can buy now. Um, and even the um, last year razor ones were, were not organic this year. They're using an organic substance in them. So they tend to be going down that route. They do also put stuff in there that will deter wildlife from, from eating them. Um, and most of them have a, an element that will make the slug light sensitive, which generally sends it underground to die. But yes, there is bad um, effects that can happen to other things that eat them. Just don't use them too much. I mean, I'll probably, if I get through maybe a kilo on nearly 400 plants, um, that's all I use. And I see people probably put that around one plant. Remember, they are a bait, they are an attractant. So sometimes the best place to put them is in your next door neighbour's garden than yours. And then you'll attract the slugs out of yours and into the hairs to kill them. Um, but a ring, don't ever put a ring of slug pellets around a plant. I think you're doing a good thing because you're not. You're just attracting them to, to that area. And they won't get them all. Um, aphids and those pesky little green caterpillars, they also come early on when the, the plants get in the ground. You often find them on the tips. One clue is, is look out for ants. Ants aren't eating the aphids, they're eating the honeydew that comes from the aphid. And quite often it's the ants that are taking the aphids up your plant and putting them in the very softest, nicest parts um, so they can farm them. Ants are effectively are farmers of aphids. So if you see ants going up and down your plant, but you can't see aphids, they won't be far behind and it's probably time to do something about it. I'm not sure that um, fairy liquid is an effective um, thing for aphids. It, I think if you catch it early enough, um, it will work as a suffocant. Um, if you've got a real problem with aphids, then probably fairy liquid is just going to make you have clean aphids and um, not really deal with a problem. The best way of dealing with any problem is not to let it become one in the first place. Um, so be observant, take your coffee around the plants in the morning and have a look every day make sure there's nothing coming that, that you don't want. These lovely little beauties, the earwigs. Um, there's no, not much point worrying about earwigs until flowering time. They won't bother the plants early on. That's going to be your slugs and your snails. Um, they, they really are a pest of the flower. And if your garden flowers end up with your petal being nibbled, do you mind? Not really. Just pull them out if, you really, if it offends you. Um, but in the vase, you won't notice. Um, straw traps on the ends of the sticks um, are fine if you've got time to uh, go around and check them all the time to be able to do something with them. Um, but generally, if you've got used bamboo canes, they've got holes in the tops. And earwigs are nocturnal, they only tend to come out um, of the night and, and eat, your, eat your buds with the young petals. So, um, just, just on the uh, cane there, just I use a bit of um, paraffin down the end, just a couple of drops, and they come out coughing, spluttering, and hit the floor. Um, and it's an effective way without spreading insecticides everywhere for the sake of it. Um, and once or twice, once they're at, at flowering time, you could also protect the stem with a bit of Vaseline. I don't, unfortunately, Darren Everest is, is not on this uh, call. He's a, buys up most of the Vaseline produced, I think, in the UK for his, his dahlias, but you just smear a bit on the footstalk of the stem and the, the earwigs generally won't go past that uh, barrier. So it's, it's a good way of doing it without too much um, spraying of the plants. But get a torch, go out at night and pick them off. Um, there's many ways, but they're not really the problem that um, I think we make it. Um, this would be the third thing I would say to stick to, to stop or not. 
Um, people get frightened of taking the tops out of their plants. Oh, I'm losing the flower. The reason plants get too tall and the reason they fall over um, is because you don't stop them. If you wait for the, the crown bud to flower, um, then the plant will harden at the base of the plant. And then when that flower finishes, it's only the top half of the plant that then produces side shoots to continue to flower. Um, so you're already two, you know, foot and a half in the air. If you stop the plant and encourage the laterals and the, the side shoots to come from lower down, then you will keep the base of the plant from low down. It'll be more stable, shorter and easier to control. Um, and you'll encourage an even number of breaks at an even thickness. So it's just a good way of starting a good flush. Sacrifice one for the eight or ten that will come earlier than they would if you left a one. Um, and just to make sure you're not probably in the garden, you don't want to be doing this much past the end of June. The earlier you've got a plant in plant that's got three or four pairs of leaves and you can winkle the tip out of it, do it, even if it's in the pot. Um, it will just encourage the flower, the plants to produce shoots and flower early. Um, and that's all you're trying to get is, is uh, just shoots on the side of the stem. Um, and you can see that will form a strong base um, of the plant early on and just let them come up to produce buds and flower. Do you want to restrict them? No, not probably for the garden. The only thing you might want to look at is if you're <clears throat> intentionally growing dinner plates, giants, large, mediums. If you want them as a larger flower, you might want to restrict them to perhaps having six shoots would be fine. They'll still be big flowers. Um, you don't need to go to the efforts of two or three like we would for show. Um, but much below that, just anything up to 10 or 12, I wouldn't worry about it. Just let, let them grow. Um, if you're growing palms, then you might want to just stop them again, probably at this stage, just to double up um, and get them out. Um, the irrigation in the, the photo was uh, here is a, a drip line one um, I used on my old plot. I can't use it now because um, I can only use watering cans, so it's a complete waste of time. But as a gardener system with, with drips inbuilt every 12 inches along the pipe, it saved absolutely hours, cost a bit, but um, I can't use it now, watering cans only. And beyond that stage, really, it's that. Water, water again, and again, and again, and wait. Um, do the work early. Everything is early with, with dahlias. If you put the effort in early, get the plant nice and strong, nice and low, ready to go, then let it go. You're winding the spring up like the old clockwork mouse. And once you've got it nice and tight, it will go and do what it's going to do. Um, if you do feed, as I said, once a fortnight, once a month, anything's better than nothing. Um, and make sure you just, as the plant grows, you, you tire them, support them, um, pretty much up until the buds start coming. And then you probably, that's where your last time will need to be. Just, just the longer you've got them growing, keep an eye. This one makes people scream, uh, squirm. Um, the gain is worth the pain. It, I, I don't think I've ever told anyone that's gone, oh, no, I don't do spud, I only grow for the garden, um, to try it. I don't think I've had anyone come back and say, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> um, will, you know, the stems get weak, the flowers aren't as full as they expect. If, if you're buying a variety because you've seen a nice picture of it, it's probably been grown quite well. And that's where the pictures come from, not just with everything left to get on with it. Um, so the, on the left there, shows it with the stems. You don't need to start going in there with tweezers. You can wait until you can comfortably do it easily. And you're just going to remove the, the side bud here and the next pair down. Um, probably two pairs of leaves is sensible to start. And I would say as you go into the season, so once they start producing their second or third flush of flowers, it's worth going down further, taking more side shoots off because your plant is producing more flowers. So your energy is dissolved over more flowers. The stems will naturally get weaker um, and you, you will need to just give them a helping hand there by removing some more side shoots. I quite like, and I find it pains me to say it, I quite like cut flowers when they actually have got the wing buds on in the vase. I think it looks quite attractive. If you want that, then just leave the wing buds on but take the next pair down off, you know, just remove some side shoots below that. And you'll probably find the extra energy in that stem will still give you a decent straight stem that will stay hard and not fall over every time it rains. But yeah, 
the, the pain is worth the pain. Do it. Get them early. Stop them. Disbud. Someone's quite handy with their uh, drawing. Um, disbud. And um, you won't go far wrong, really. Um, I, I know it's not you, Ian. <laughs> um, so we can see that that's just a description. We saw it last week. Terminal bud, wing buds, first pair, second pair. Those shoots that you can see, if you can remove these top ones here, we're not removing leaves. We're not doing anything other than just taking these bits here off and the wing buds. That will give you, on most varieties, a, a foot stalk of probably 18 inches, two foot cutting length without cutting out buds and shoots that will come later if you cut the flowers. And what you've got to remember is that this little shoot down here, in two weeks time, that will probably be up here with a bud in it. In two weeks time, this bud will be a flower. So when you cut that flower, you're cutting and leaving the next bud to flower. You're not, you're not really putting months between flowering or stopping them flower for ages. As long as you leave these ones, two pairs, three pairs down, they will replace the flowering stem once it's flowered and you've either deadheaded it or you've cut it for the vase indoors. So just don't be afraid to do it. Have a go. This is uh, Halls of Hedden. You know, as far as I know, David just goes around and does wing buds and a pair down, maybe a little bit more on the larger ones, but he hasn't got the time to go around side shooting all the way down. He doesn't really mess about restricting numbers. They're stopped at an appropriate point and left to flower and grow. And he's growing these in the field. You know, masses and masses of plants. He hasn't got armies of people out there. And they just grow, and this is what they do. They grow and they flower. Um, the method you can see is growing through a mesh to support them. That's because it's got plants on mass and plants that are all of a similar habit together. Mesh works fine in blocks, but if you're growing different varieties and different heights, then you need to use a method that will um, work to each individual height of the plant that's growing. Um, mesh won't really do that very easily. That's what we're doing it for. If, you, if that's what you're doing it for and that's what you love, um, above all, grow as many as you can, as many as you can care for well and enjoy them in whatever way you want to do it. Don't grow thousands of plants and think they're going to be great. Learn how many, how much time you've got, because it takes time. Um, even growing them in the garden, it's, it's a regular check. Grow what you comf comfortably can grow, then you won't get upset when things don't work out so well. You won't get fed up with doing it. Um, and grow what you like, you like the look of. Don't matter if someone says that, David Howe's a fantastic variety. If you don't like the look of it, don't grow it. Grow one you like the look of, um, and then you're, you're more likely to put the effort in and, and get the results and enjoy seeing them on your side wall. Then maybe one day you'll become as nutty as the rest of us. Um, we all started somewhere. <laughs> Some of us started uh, showing from day one, and that generally starts with quite a lot of disappointment every time you get beaten, every time you turn up at the show, but you soon learn. Um, and these are your two people that will be going into the, the breakout rooms, Ian and Andrew. Um, couldn't find a more recent picture, Ian, unfortunately, but the flowers were decent. Um, so we're, we'll accept that. Um, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you at the next talk. Now, I didn't cover storage, tuber storing. Um, and I sort of done it on purpose um, because there are so many ways. Um, and it's, it's down to the environment, down to what you do. I do it as easy as possible. I'm sure Ian and, and most of the others, we all do it. As exhibitors, we probably store tubers in the least complicated way you'll ever see um, on, on Facebook, YouTube, or anything else. We tend to just dig them up, shake them off, maybe wash them off, I don't, shake them off, flip them upside down if, we, if we've got the time for, for a week or so, and just put them in the greenhouse. The key to it really is not letting them get too cold, i.e. frosted, or let them get too hot, keep the airflow around them. And that's really about it, keeping an eye on them. Um, I don't generally trim mine up too much and, and I haven't got time. Um, I'll do that when I start to wake them up, 
and probably because as a showman we tend to start hours earlier than than most would need to then it's not so hard but then our tubers will have big fat stems on them that want to rot where ones that are growing not so keenly won't so there's loads of ways i wouldn't start off your experiences in storing tubers by using plastic bags um, wrapping them in cling film or anything like that if you find the other methods aren't working and you try it and it works good luck to you stick with it um, i wouldn't change anything but there are so many ways under the stairs and in the loft in the down, you just got to keep them frost free keep the air around them and not too hot beyond that there isn't much more to it and you'll only evolve your own way um, i'm sure ian in the breakout room will, will cover this more um, hopefully if you've got more questions but it's it's one of those emotive things that only uh, you you will find your way all right let's, let's stop this share and hopefully we come back so i'm just going to pull this chat window over so i can see uh, what's on there oh our Mexican friends here. Nice of you to join us. Thank you. Um, can storage be in the dark? Yeah, um, it can, but you might find that the um, tubers will form eyes or start to sprout if it's too warm. Um, and that's a, it's, it's all about, it's like taking cuttings. It's about the balances of the environment. Um, I tend to not keep <coughs> mine in the dark, I'm just in the greenhouse on the bench. And if it's not a cold day, the door gets opened. If it is a cold day, the door stays shut. Um, and that's about it. So we'll um, probably go straight into using these uh, breakout rooms. Um, those of you that want to stay here and ask me questions, you can stay here. I'm sure, please go off and talk to uh, the two in the breakout rooms. If you go down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see breakout rooms and they're, they'll be titled um, Ian and Andrew, Ian's covering, as I said, propagation and storage, Andrew, general growing. So if you want to broaden the, uh, the the questioning beyond what, what I've covered, then ask them or stay here and ask me. So if you want to have a couple of minutes to go to sort yourselves out and join the rooms, um, and then we'll uh, carry on from here and probably un unmute you. people moving along. Well, Andrew, have you managed to get into your room? <laughs> I can still see you there. No, mine's not letting me move to the room. I've just done, Andrew. All right. So should he still be here? He's just gone. I think he's just gone. He's gone. There yeah. we go. Right, so if anyone else disappears, that's fine. We can cope with that. But um, it looks like we've got quite a few people moving off to the rooms, which is good. And I'll just close that. And we won't have um, 